Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, we really went off like a rocket when we started recording uh, or we started speaking on this on this StreamYard yeah. call. So I was like, so, we so better we go record fast. <laughs> exactly, exactly that. But Mark, for those that aren't acquainted with you, I want to ask, who is Mark Lewis at the time of recording in late 2022? Uh, um, well, that's, that's in the deep end. Um, I am a, I, I hesitate to use the word fitness, but uh, but it's most appropriate, a fitness YouTuber. Uh, of a small uh, scale so uh, I've been doing it for a couple of years um, and only six months or so properly and and recently went full-time doing it uh, that, yeah is that enough I don't know we'll do it <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, make, I make YouTube videos of me running around and, uh, and exercising basically in very simple terms um, but without uh, I suppose what makes me a little bit different to some uh, or many is that I have no fitness, uh, uh, certainly no professional fitness background, no training in fitness. Um, I just, I'm just a, a hobbyist that uh, likes to kind of likes to find finds value in showing people what I'm up to, and people seem to find some value in seeing that. So there's no, oh, there's very little expertise. It, it's it's very much this is what I'm doing. Uh, hopefully that's interesting, entertaining, motivating. If you want to do the same, crack on. I don't recommend you do the same necessarily because i don't know who's watching um but uh yeah so it's, it, it, it kind of gives me some freedom to just do whatever i like because at no point am i saying you should also be doing this in fact on some occasions i actively say you probably shouldn't be doing this this is nuts i'm um as a daft example i ran 100k a couple of months ago and i didn't train for that i just uh, well i said i didn't train i ran 10k the week before uh and i then just went around 100 and that's an example of me saying to someone hopefully that's funny to watch but it's also stupid so um you know do it if you want but don't send me the hospital bill i think you're being very modest mark you've built up a really um engaged channel with some incredible different videos but i, I want to go back to life well before the the fitness youtube because when i look at your i blocked fitness- that out like men in black i <laughs> click it's been wiped, <laughs> it's been wiped. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's uh, it's funny because when I look at um, your kind of fitness and your health, uh, for me, it looks like a reverse bell curve. So when you were younger, mm. you were into your fitness. I know you were kind of working in the industry. And yep. then when you were going through your career, that fell off to an extent that you were actually quite unhealthy. And now we have this kind of very healthy content creator now who's doing all these different fitness challenges and fitness focuses. And I wonder what the story was at different times in your life that led to that kind of outward thing that we see. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean that, that 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 that's certainly a good summary of it. So when I was when I was younger, I mean, you say I was in the industry. I was in the industry, but not uh, in the sense that anybody nowadays would recognise it. So when I was fourteen, I worked as a lifeguard um, back when there weren't really rules about how old you had to be to be a lifeguard. Uh, and and there was a gym at the pool that I worked at, and, and one day the circuit training uh, coach didn't turn up. So the, the boss of the center said to me, oh, you, you know, you, you've done the circuit training class a few times yourself as a, as a participant. Can you just take the circuit training class, which basically just involved me playing uh, the Rocky soundtrack and telling people to do push-ups? That was almost entirely it. But I thought, oh, that's really fun. That's quite enjoyable. And as a 14-year-old, telling adults what to do was cool. And, um, and, and it paid more than being a lifeguard. So... I got into being a fitness instructor, but but as I say, this would have been so. This would have been um, ninety, I mean, late eighties, and yeah, it was it was there was no rules, there was no regulations, there was no qualifications. Um, well, actually, I, I that's probably untrue. There's probably people watching this that go, yes, there were. I took many of them. Um, if there were, I didn't take them, and no one cared. That that's how the rules worked back then. So I ended up. Uh, running a gym for my local council by the time I was 17-ish and through to about 19, I just did that. I, I, I ran gyms for the council or worked in gyms for the council um, and just in, enjoyed it. I mean, I was, a, I was I had no qualifications at all, but I worked in that world. And then I I left it because it didn't, it didn't, although it paid more than being a lifeguard, that's not a high bar to uh, exceed in the first place. It wasn't enough to live on as a as an adult, so I, I quit. So that was that was my fitness history. People say, "Oh, you did work in the industry. You do know what you're doing." I was a kid with a 
hat that had coach written on it and a, a ghetto blaster if um anyone remembers what those are uh, and a rocky cassette that, that was that was it that's peak motivational music though isn't it nowadays like if, you, if maybe for some of your challenges you've got the rocky soundtrack playing as well yeah well it, well it, i mean yeah indeed i mean it, it's funny because people i am for, for my kind of yeah, that was then, and it's not now. Type type attitude about about how it used to work. A lot of it still applies. I mean, if you if you play, um, if you played a Rocky Four soundtrack to anybody over the age of sort of thirty, certainly forty, and tell them to do push ups, they will do more push ups than without that music. That's scientific fact. Um, it works. So, yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, actually, a lot of what we used to do actually is 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 better i believe than, than than what's going on today especially the focus today on aesthetics over fitness completely i mean actually if people went back to some of the the values and the approaches and the emphasis that we had on on exercise in the 80s and the 90s it would it would be better uh, certainly for young people I and mean, when i was that age i i was into getting bigger i mean obviously this would be late 80s early 90s so you know, Arnold was the kind of very, a very obvious example of, of people that someone that people looked up to that was big, but but we also saw someone like Arnold uh, or, or Stallone or whatever it might be as being a, a complete wacky outlier. I mean, that was almost cartoon esque. So although you might be motivated by watching an Arnold movie or something, uh, you didn't have any aspirations of wanting to be Arnold. That that wasn't your aspiration. Your, your aspiration was to be somebody more like kind of a Daily Thompson, someone that's fit and genuinely fit and could run and jump and lift and what we would now call hybrid athletes but back then you just called it somebody that exercised yeah olympian yeah it, 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 literally that uh, and yet now when people watch whoever chris bumstead or whoever they're um or maybe even arnold still whoever their their sort of giant jacked influences rather than being influenced by that person to be inspired to do their thing they literally are inspired to emulate that person. And um, and it's a bit weird, really, nowadays that people are, especially young men, are just so focused on wanting to emulate bodybuilders. Because when I, when I was growing up and training, I was inspired by that, but I wasn't uh, in any way. I, I had aspirations to be whoever, Sean Ray or whoever was big at the time. Lee Haney was um, around. Obviously, Dorian Yates was starting to come on the scene. I mean, Dorian Yates is a really good example Dorian Yates came on the scene and whenever that was early 90s and everyone looks at Dorian Yates and thinks oh my goodness that man is not human what an inspiration I'm going to go and uh, go for a jog or you know, whatever it might be nobody thought yeah yeah I'll do that I'll, I'll, I'll get a back that's five times wider than the average human being it's like the uh, recognition and, 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 and importantly take whatever um, drugs are required to achieve it that, exactly that what never, I was going to say Mark never entered anyone's mind you're and so it was right. available. It was just as available then as it was now, um, but it never even occurred to you because there was no there was no genuine motivation to do it. You're so right because these guys are like top one percent genetics, but also with the top one percent training attitude and the lifestyle, as well as all the PEDs that come with that. So what they have built is completely unattainable. But I think because we have like these uh, almost like Aldi versions on social media all day, every day, and on TV, we we maybe work towards those guys as well. And it's uh, it's very common to see guys, like you say, chasing purely aesthetics. And that's certainly a training style that I've mimicked largely. But I think I've done some of the self-work, which means that I'm quite comfortable with the decisions that I've made. Whereas, like I, for example, I've stayed lifetime natural, albeit I've built a relatively good physique. But I've trained in a way that's been concurrent with what I want. Whereas I think a lot of people as you've rightly said, they look at these guys and they think, I just have to bodybuild. I don't need to do my version of fitness, which might be 5K two times a week and maybe one yeah. or two weight sessions alongside that rather yeah. than the, the six days in the gym and the, the, the counting every calorie or every every meal. Actually, it's interesting what you say because, because the, the, the kind of the Audi version of, of, of what used to be Arnold and Sloan and so on, the, the slight danger, well, actually the huge danger is that youngsters... Uh, so back in the day, you you would understand that Arnold was a complete out there on his own freak because he was a guy at the movies. You didn't see him unless you you rocked up to watch Terminator or something. The trouble nowadays is that because you can just pick up your phone and and scroll through you know, you know one after another, 
of these people who are apparently just normal people out there who just happen to be incredibly jacked. It's incredibly easy to think, oh, wow, looking like that isn't some sort of um, state reserved for just the odd elite who ends up being um, you know, the most famous actor in the world. Although that's still the case. The Rock is an obvious example of that. There is that. But actually, it's available to anybody because I can look through Instagram and see that there's hundreds of people that look like that. So it, mu it must be um, available. The reality still is that when you're scrolling through Instagram and you're seeing one jacked dude after another, you still aren't looking at the guy next door. Uh, if you want to see the guy next door, walk outside, go next door and look at him. And he's a fat bloke. That's the guy next door. Th th those hundreds and hundreds of people on Instagram that are jacked are still the top 1% in the entire world because there's 8 billion people. So you don't, you know, th th those hundreds on Instagram, it's not everybody. It's still this tiny, tiny percentage. And the reason they're on Instagram, the reason you're seeing them is because they're that tiny 1%. If everybody looked like that, nobody on Instagram would look like that because there'd be no value in looking like that. So the danger is that people now think, oh, it's, it's easily available, it's easily achievable uh, because I see it everywhere. It, it, it's still not the reality. You know, you're going to go into your town centre and look at 100 people, you'll see 60% of them are overweight and 30% of them are obese. And, and occasionally you'll see the odd guy that looks in reasonable shape. But you still won't see a um, whoever. I mean, without kind of getting into who's, who's doing what, but just, just examples of what people want to look like. A Mike Thurston, a Matt Does Fitness. Uh, yeah, th those sort of, that sort of... Um, the genetic that's... elite that are generally gifted. Yeah, to. absolutely. Irrespective of what they do or don't do. Um, that... That that isn't those guys aren't the, the the car the guy next door. Those are still the top one percent, and in that one percent is also the Rock, and and whoever else. But but they're up there with them. They aren't normal at all. Agreed. One of the things you've you points you made there is around this kind of sixty percent of the population being obese, and I want to pop a pin in that. And we'll definitely get back to that later on because I've seen one of your videos on this topic, which I thought was incredibly important in in terms of the discussion around obesity. But I wanted to ask about. After you were a lifeguard, you moved into financial services, but your health um, did not correlate with the the man that we see we see in front of us today creating content. What was happening during that period that, that led to you not being as um, I, I got, not being I, got focused? I got rich and fat basically. That, 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 that's that in a nutshell. I mean, I just um, I, I I very I, I joined financial services at the end of the nineties when it was still it was kind of coming out of the Wolf of Wall Street era but it wasn't entirely out of it yet. It certainly wasn't like what it is today. As an example, as a lifeguard, you could walk into that industry and within a year or so be making um, a, 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 an obscene amount of money. That you clearly can't do that today, but you could do it then. Um, so it, it, was, it was pretty much like that. I mean, it, we were just coming off the back of the whole kind of Wall Street uh, yuppie, everyone's driving 911s type. It, it was still very much that. So I got into it and and just, yeah, just suddenly realised, oh my goodness, if I if I work from very early in the morning till very late at night and work the weekends and just work and work and work, I can make a lot of money and and that became the focus. Uh, and it's easy, yeah. Why, why wouldn't that be the focus? You know, house house prices were getting really expensive. It was it was ninety thousand pounds to buy a four bedroom detached in, in the southeast. So we've seen an incredible lot of money back then. So the focus was just earning money. And the, the, the diet wasn't anything that I really thought about other than, oh, I'm hungry, so I'll eat and I'll have a burger because that's quick and easy. And, and yeah, I didn't really think about it. And suddenly I got to probably 27, 28 and thought, oh, I've, I'm now 24 stone. I don't know what that is in, in old money. Um, um, I'm trying to convert that for I mean, way over 300 pounds, um, very large for a, for a, a human being, and but I didn't care because I was also uh, I don't know, I can't remember 27. What was I doing then? I don't know, whizzing around in a super Impreza Turbo, pretending to be Colin McRae, and um, just yeah, I mean it was just I just didn't care. I was married also. I got married quite young, had kids by then, had a house. So all the things, I and mean, I used to say, um, there's only really two, and, and I've kind of I've slightly deviated from this opinion. But my early on opinion was there's only really two reasons why I exercise. What, as, a, as a man in particular, when, when you're young, you exercise because you want to find somebody, um, and uh, 
I'm not quite sure how uh, how family friendly your podcast is, so I'm I'm keeping my language. You can swear, say whatever um, you like. Okay, so so okay. Well, I, I, I I've started polite, so I'll finish. <laughs> so yeah, you, you exercise to, to to find somebody when you're young, and then as you get older, you you start exercising to avoid dying. That that that's really the only two motivations. It's and that and that's just natural, you know. Whether you're whatever that fucking lion or something, you you, you want to you want to just have baby lions and then not die. And that's it. So as a sort of heading towards 30 something that had a house and a wife and, and kids, I, I had no, you know, why, why go to the gym? Why, you know, what, why? I, I can go to work and earn lots of money. Um, uh, or by that point, even more dangerous, I don't need to go to work very much anymore because by the time I was 30, I was running my own business in that, in that world, which meant I could work three or four days a week and still earn very good money and, and just have a very nice what I considered in inverted commas nice life. Uh, why? Why would you go to the gym? There's just no need. Uh, and also, I'm tall, six six. So being three hundred plus pounds at six six doesn't it doesn't look um, quite as bad as uh, if if I was five eight. I'd, I mean, if I was five eight, I'd have looked, I'd have looked uh, ridiculous. But I hit it. There's that whole term, Mark, that you would have you would have held it better because you're just broad yes. shoulders. I mean, uh, yeah, indeed. I, I was a high functioning. Uh, overweight person to, to sort of use uh, a, a, an addiction um, terminology I was I, I, I operated um, without appearing to be as heavy as I was but I was obviously hugely heavy um, yeah and, and that was it that was just my life I, did, I didn't care and, and and also funnily enough I'm, I've got a video coming up um, very very soon on you know the secret weapon for uh, weight loss or any sort of fitness improvement is it, friends and family uh, in the sense, and, and, and the secret weapon, in the sense that, like a, a baseball bat, you keep under the under the bed, you you could you know use it to great effect, or you could smash yourself in the face with it. Because friends and family can can do that if you have the right friends and family around. And first of all, if you have no friends and family, you're fine. You, you, you're just neutral. But friends and family can be incredibly positive and say, "Hey, why aren't you on it? Why or why are you eating that today?" And they can do that, or they can do what I was surrounded by, and most people are, to be fair, which is friends and family saying, oh, you don't, you know, you're not, you're not that big. And, you know, well, you, you're tall, aren't you? And tall, I was a nine foot tall. So um, I was just surrounded by people telling me it, it's fine and it's normal. And worryingly, that this would have been in the sort of early 2000s when it was no way near as bad as it is nowadays where I could, Today, walk it. If I was three hundred pounds today, I could. It would take me five seconds to find a fitness influencer, massive inverted commas, uh, obese inverted commas, that is also three hundred pounds and and would die running a five k and be told, no, that's fitness. So it's even worse today to find examples that just um, enable you to to plod on. I completely shape. agree. And I think when you raise things like friends and family, your network and your environment play a massive, massive role. And yeah. as you said, people were being what we would all term as kind and supportive of you at that stage. But sometimes kindness and support comes from maybe having a harsh conversation to say, Mark, for your own health, can you take some action on losing some weight? Yeah. Because we want you around in your 40s and 50s, but nobody says yeah. that. No, in fact, the, the opposite. What happens is when you lose some weight, uh, people will say, "Oh, are you feeling okay? You look, you're looking ill." And I, I'd be saying to people, "How? I'm looking ill. I'm, I'm still 24 percent body fat. You, you got no idea what you're talking about. I was ill when I was eating nine Big Macs for breakfast, and you didn't say a thing. Uh, but now that I'm down to, you know, down to 18 stone, still grossly overweight. Uh, now you think I'm, I'm looking poorly." Um, and, and the only reason people say that is that there's the, there's the, the frog in boiling water thing where if it's your close family, they just don't realize that they don't realize what's happening. They don't see the day to day changes. And then suddenly they, you know, especially family you haven't seen for a while, they go, oh, I, I didn't realize you, you, you changed. There's, there's that, there's that kind of shock. Um, and that happens a lot with uh, people like celebrities. And so I remember when Adele lost loads of weight, everyone's going, oh my God, she doesn't look very, doesn't look very good. She looked ill. She, she, she was unhealthy. Um, and now she's not, but people are shocked and, and they interpret that as a bad thing. They should be shocked. Mark, regarding, a, um, regarding Adele, I should have a klaxon on the podcast when that comes up because a lot of people have raised that because one of the biggest, most frightening aspects of that was when she lost weight, people attacked her for losing weight yeah, because she'd left yeah. the tribe of 
you mentioned it, high functioning, overweight people. She was super yeah. talented. She was super successful. And the narrative was she can do this despite the fact that she's overweight. And yes, Queen, you do it for yourself and whatever terminology people throw yeah. around nowadays. So when she moved brave. away from that and became a healthier How version, brave. brave, exactly. <laughs> exactly. When she moved away from that, she almost shone a light on the fact that actually she's created greater longevity. Maybe she can produce more good music because she's healthier. She'll perform longer on stage. Yeah. She'll, be, she'll be around for years to come. But people disliked the fact that she had left the the tribe or the group that she was purporting to be a member of previously. And they were deeply uncomfortable that they had um, almost it shone a light on their own flaws as well. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly that. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's insane that, that she, she picks to uh, yeah spend longer on the planet to spend her money and uh, people have an issue and, it, and it's, it is, it is absolutely bonkers. And, and it, what, what's even, what's even more bonkers is that it, if you juxtapose uh uh, excess weight with any other form of self-harm which is effect- i mean in the most simple sense if you eat so much that your body swells up beyond where it's supposed to and causes you damage you are there, there's no other term for it than self-harm and and that's not to say that it's any more within your control than any other form of self-harm i mean it's, this isn't a case of saying oh you know eat more move less you're, you're lazy that's not the case at all um but it but call it what it is self-harm if you saw somebody uh, on stage singing away and you noticed that they had cuts on their arm, as a very simple example of, of a very obvious form of self-harm, people would be saying, oh, my goodness, I hope she's getting help for that. I hope she's, that, that seems to be incredibly um, damaging to her mental health, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and yet somebody will see somebody who's grossly overweight, which, as a bottom line, has more health implications long term. I mean, the hospitals are filled up with people that are there because they ate badly. They aren't filled up with people there that, that cut themselves, although that's not to say that's not clearly an horrendous situation needs fixing. But it isn't one that leads to the sort of health implications that being overweight does. And yet people go, one is, is terrible. We've got to help this person. They need, they need support and assistance. And, and this person is just cuddly and, and, and roly-poly and brave. And, and yeah, yeah, you, yeah you, you wear that, that sheer dress on the red carpet. You, you, look, you look amazing. Um, no, you don't. You look, you look horrific. You look, you know, that's bad. And not, not again. It's not to proportion blame or fault because I understand completely uh, the the issue that the the, the the trouble with going from one to the other, one you know, heavy to to, to not. Um, it's nothing to do with that. It's it's people's in, it's people's uh, acceptance, uh, or, or not even acceptance. It's people's desire to see people be big because as you say it, it supports their own narrative if they're living in a world where they're telling themselves this is fine this is good this is this is all these things if you have somebody pop up on screen that is those things as well um yeah it's it's very it's reassurance supportive. Yeah, it's absolutely. public reassurance at the highest yeah. level yeah. if it wasn't if it wasn't friends and family what, what were some of the moments when you decided that at 23 stone i need to start to come down the way well, I, I, this, my my answer to this is annoying because it it doesn't it doesn't help anybody, and I've said it a few times on on videos. There was no, but well, there was there was a moment where I thought today is the day. The trouble is, people want that moment to be associated with something because it then gives them, um, it, it, you know, if you're saying to somebody, I was at, I was at A and now I'm at B, they want they want to see that map so they can either follow it or at least be inspired that there's some sort of theory behind it. And, and the reality is that my, my I now need to lose weight moment came about for a reason I can't even remember. And, and the best example of this, I have a friend who uh, is a uh, recovered alcoholic, hasn't had a drink in donkey's years. And I was talking to him about what was the moment that, that made you think, you know, was it going into hospital? Was it losing your job, your relationship? Was it all these things? And he said, no, it was none of those obvious bottom of the barrel moments. It was one day, it was raining, and I was walking to get some beer in the rain. And it just occurred to me that, that going out in the rain was daft. And, and for the reason I was doing it, it was even more daft. So I thought, I'll stop drinking. And then didn't drink the next, hasn't had a drink in you know, 20, 30 years. And that was the same with me. So I had, yeah, I could, I could mention all sorts of, moments where it would be obvious to occur to me yeah having whatever i'd know my, my fourth big Mac at 3 a.m in the morning um and 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 being ill from doing so 
those would be obvious moments to think now I should stop. But it but it wasn't one of those, it wasn't any of those things. It, it, it would have just I don't know what the the straw was that that broke the donkey's back. I can never tell if it's a donkey or camel, but whatever, camel. whatever was loaded up with straw, camel. <laughs> Um, whatever animal it was that, that we're recording in December and the donkeys are very festive, aren't they, Mark? We all talk about they the are, donkey, they? Yeah. don't we? So that's, yeah. that's what's in what, your head. Yeah, I don't know what straw it was that broke the Christmas donkey's back, um, but something did. And yes, yeah, so I woke up one day and thought that this is this is not on. I'm going to be lighter, um, and and just yeah, and I just decided that yeah, which doesn't which is very and the good news for people that are. To, to, to spin that positively to people that are hearing that and thinking, well, that's no use. I wanted to be told that it was this moment and therefore I can look forward to that myself. That the good news is that when you have something occur to you that you think should be a trigger, so whatever it is, I mean, we've got January the 1st coming up. So everyone that thinks January the 1st, that's the day for me. And by January the 10th, they're, they're eating junk again. Rather than being overly despondent that January the 1st didn't happen to be the day, uh, you shouldn't be surprised that it's not January the first because it, it because it isn't in my experience those you can't create the moment whether you say it's my birthday today I'm going to do it from tomorrow or it's January or even as everyone does Monday I'll start Monday and by Wednesday it's falling apart you can't in my experience you can't say that's the day it starts you just have to uh, create around you an environment where when it when it's time you'll be ready so that means you know if your house is full of junk food clear it out of junk food and again this is where friends and family is an issue because obviously the, um if, if your family say no we want um you know whatever kit kats in every room then it, it gets harder but create an environment around you where uh when you're ready it will be appropriate to that goal and then wait, unfortunately, and I don't have any more advice than that. Uh, the most important thing to say is it's a good habits around you so that yeah, the, the day I did decide I am now going to start, uh, I would have had everything I needed. I would have, I mean, in simple terms, you know, have I got protein powder in the house? And that's nothing to do with weight training and bodybuilding. It's just, it's just it, it, a lot of it is psychological. If I'm someone that has some protein powder in the house, I feel like someone that takes my exercise seriously. More it's very like it's, it's very much um, atomic habits, isn't it, Mark? Where it's a vote yeah, for the all, identity yeah. of the person that you want to be. So if I purchase these yes. things, then I'm the kind of person that's committed to weight loss because I've got skin in the game. I've got the materials. Exactly that. Yeah. Every, and in fact, buy that book, everybody. Um, buy that book. It, it didn't exist when I started, but I discovered when I read it that I was doing lots of those things and and then did more of them. That book is. It is essential reading, I would say, to, to anybody that, that wants to get themselves sorted. It's not that people think about goals and, oh, I'm going to get in shape because of the whatever my holiday in the summer. Um, th th those things. In fact, if you have young children, you should know that, that things that are six months away are no motivator. You say to your kid, you know, if you do this, you know, tidy your room and in three weeks time you can have whatever, hot at Disneyland, that room is not getting tidied. You say to your kid, tidy your room, and in 10 minutes, I'll give you five quid, the room's getting done, you know, and, there, and five quid is less than Disneyland. So it's you, you set goals off in the distance. Um, your brain um, is, is, is on a par with a, with a, a stupid eight-year-old in, in terms of what, what motivates it. You can't, for most people, and there'll be somebody out there going, no, I, I set a goal of my wedding and it, that was the thing. For most people, you start looking too far down the line. Um, you know, it's that old, it's that, that, that Father Ted sketch about, you know, that, that this cow's close and this cow's far away. It, you know, you hold up a burger in front of your face, it will be big enough to cover up any goal in the future. You know, behind that burger can be everything. Um, if it's in your face, you can't see it at all, and it, it's that's so a massive me, that, point, that, isn't it? That was a big one. Yeah, yeah I, I need, I, I need my my exercise bike always has to be ready to go. My trainers always have to be neat and lined up. Uh, my my, I have, I have a whole cupboard in the kitchen dedicated to healthy food. I have drawers in the bedroom dedicated to my sports kit. There is nothing between me thinking I'm going to go for a run, or I'm going to eat healthy, or, or whatever it might be, and doing it. Because if I think, oh, do you know what? I will wake up today and have a better breakfast than yesterday. But I go to the cupboard and the first thing in front of me is Cocoa Pops. Um, that isn't, I mean, it doesn't mean I will eat them, <laughs> although maybe. Uh, but it's certainly, it's a hurdle. 
and you know why it's like a smoker trying to quit smoking and scattering cigarettes around their house it just make no sense but with food or going on loads of nights out where they're drunk that's what i noticed with smoking as well like your inhibitions are going to be much more lowered if all your friends have got packets of fags with them guess what you're going to be puffing on one the smoking area by 11 o'clock yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, so, yeah. So, so atomic, atomic habits. If anyone takes anything from this podcast, yeah, go buy that book. Yes, it's yeah, what should, we I, should, own... I, should, I should be on a, I should be on a deal with him. I, I keep telling people. Oh, hundred percent. James is James Clear is one of my goal guests for the the podcast, and um, I'm I'm, I'm hopeful we'll make it happen in 2023. We're we're we're, we're, we're I'm closing the night. I'm talking to his PA now, but it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a it's, it's a work in progress. But your own yeah, steps, no, Mark. You awesome. said you bought you you bought the protein powder. What were your yeah, other yeah, steps yeah. to drop? It was over a hundred pounds, I think you dropped in the end, wasn't it? Oh yeah, and, and really quickly as well. I, I I um I started running. I didn't actually focus heavily on diet, um, because my diet was so bad that if I had a daily task of going for a run, it, it would it would filter back that I couldn't I physically couldn't eat the way I was eating because you can't go for a run four minutes after your last burger. And I was almost operating in a, in, a, in a dietary way that was basically constant eating. So just the very process of thinking I'm running at 7 p.m. meant I would have to stop eating at 5 p.m. Otherwise, I'd feel ill going for a run. And that's how bad my diet was, just having a stop eating at 5 o'clock um, and don't eat between 7 and 8 because you're out running was enough to have some some dietary impact. And I, yeah, I just went running. Uh, I... I yeah, I mean, it's simple as that. I bought some trainers. I went, I went running. I spent one month doing that and then discovered that every joint in my body hurt. So I stumbled across the book Born to Run, which is all about running barefoot. And, and a lot of it's been debunked since, but I don't care. It, it inspired me to try minimalist shoes. Uh, I, I'm a big believer in, um, people call it bro science. I, I'm a big believer in being able for my own motivation to link what I'm doing back to what it would seem obvious my body is supposed to be able to do. And I don't really care if people say, ah, oh, bro science or not. To me, it just, that feels right. And if something feels right, I'm more inclined to go and pursue it. And so with barefoot running or minimalist shoe running, it just occurred to me that as a human being, it seemed weird that going out for a jog would leave every joint in my body aching. It, it just it just felt to me that, that that didn't seem to be how a human being should uh, uh, recover from a run by having to lie down for a week. That I thought, well, hang on, mate. If I was you know, 20,000 years ago, I'd, I'd die in a cave if, if it hurt every time I went for a jog. So I stopped wearing my cushioned um overly supportive shoes i started wearing vibrant five fingers everyone said you, you're 340 pound you can't run in you, you have to have a, an air pocket under your heel otherwise it's all going to fall apart i thought really i don't i'm not so sure uh and yeah I, I i touch wood never had a running injury that wasn't caused by gross stupidity uh since so that that book as well born to run that literally changed my life uh and, and, and just jogging just jogging. Um, I did lamppost technique. So I, because I, I couldn't jog properly, I'd jog to a lamppost. Then I'd walk to the next lamppost. Um, probably walk to the one after that as well. Then I'd jog again and I'd come home. And the next night I'd try and do, you know, jog two lampposts. I know they're very, very, I actually have a very quick, you know, the, the beauty of newbie games when you're so far away from anything remotely decent is that they come fast. So I went from, not being able to run a hundred yards, literally, to being able to go out and jog for ten minutes nonstop, which at the time was just I mean I can remember looking at my watch and thinking, oh my goodness, I've been running for ten minutes. Yeah, running, I'd say running, staggering along for ten minutes. I can't believe that. That that was such an achievement. And when I first did it for half an hour, I probably in half an hour I probably did three K. I was my mind was blown that, that I could do that. Obviously now I run all day this links uh, massively mark to what you were saying about the immediate positive feedback loop in terms of the goal so in the same way like if your child cl cleans his room you'll get a fiver in 10 minutes you were like if i yeah. can get this quick result from just the entry level of running lamppost to lamppost walking to the next one and and just building it up quite quickly when somebody's in a position like yourself where your your health was so out of whack 
the results come quite quickly and that positive feedback loop should encourage you to chase more and more and more. Whereas I suppose if you'd set a goal for in six months time, I'm going to have lost 50 pounds. It's maybe it's, it's less tangible. It's less, it's less easy to, to, to touch and to think and to see that happening because it's so far in the distance. Whereas you were seeing weekly probably, or maybe even daily improvements in terms of your ability daily. to move. Absolutely. Daily. Yeah. And, and also something that I did then and do now and encourage people to do is I was recording those improvements because, and I see this now, my, my wife, Jenna started training this year as, as a, someone that hadn't really done exercise before. And I saw in her what I've, recognized in myself which is that she would make huge improvements uh she would run a park run a uh, 5k so 3.3 and a bit miles and she'd run it in let's say half an hour and the following month she'd go and run it in 29 minutes 40 seconds and she'd go oh i'm still you know, i've only knocked 20 seconds off i'm still one of the slower people there blah 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 wine 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 i say hang on you've knocked 20 seconds off that's not very much, is it? I say, are you kidding? 20 seconds. If you knock 20 seconds off every month, in three years' time, you'll be uh, faster than Mo Farah. I mean, that, you know, that, that's the, you know, plot that graph out. That's the progression you're on. In fact, not only is 20 seconds um, huge, it's actually so huge, it's unsustainable, because I can assure you, you won't be faster than Mo Farah. So at some point, your 20 seconds are going to taper off, because you're simply gaining too much too soon. So what you think is not enough and irrelevant is actually massive and you can't even keep it going. And I, you know, so for example, if you, if you run one lamppost, walk a lamppost, and the next night you run two lampposts, you just had a hundred percent increase in your lamppost uh, running. Clearly that isn't sustainable. Otherwise by now I'd be able to run around the, run around the planet. So uh, by tracking that, and maybe this is because I worked in finance um, and was doing graphs all day long, I just said, well, how I'm here, and, and, and you know, I was at this point on the graph, and now I'm at this point on the graph, and draw a line and see where it keeps going. Oh, yeah, it does indeed appear I'm going to be entering the Olympics at the age of 54. Um, clearly, that won't happen. So I suppose what I have to look forward to, or, or not look forward to, is things slowing down because I'm gaining too quick. And that gave me a sort of a, a, a mental slap when I was thinking this isn't happening fast enough. And, and sure enough, I was, I was probably my late mid late 30s then and thought this is all over i'm going to be 40 soon and, and that's the end of life and now i'm 49 i can't wait to turn 50 i mean it's just because things just keep getting better and better and so and you know, yeah that's the other thing that helps the older you get the more you realize that um you do have time you, you know that there is life doesn't end at 40 50 you, you know that's what Great about doing YouTube. I have so many people in their 60s and 70s email me saying, hey, I'm doing what you're doing. It's it's great. And that's inspiring. So I have no, I don't have today at 49 the concerns I had at 35 about there's not enough time. I, it's not happening fast enough. I To me at 50, I'm happy to start as I do. New activities all the time. And think, I've got years to improve at that. I'll, you know, anything. I want to learn the guitar. I want to learn the guitar. I'm going to start when I'm 55. And by the time I'm 65, I've been playing guitar for 10 years. I'll be pretty good. You know, I've, yeah. seen kids on, I've seen kids on YouTube playing guitar after two years, and they're, they're rocking it. So, so I, I, I don't worry about, oh, it needs to happen today. It needs to happen tomorrow. Um, it, I need to see improvement day to day, but they will add up. Yeah, I, I, I love that, Mark. And I've, I've heard you say before that you have almost like reversed your aging process and that you're almost getting younger and healthier each year the closer yeah. you get to 50 which for the vast majority of the population and we're definitely getting on to where the where the population is at we've hinted at it throughout the podcast it's um it's refreshing that you're kind of going against the grain from that perspective and like i say that reverse bell curve where your fitness was at a good level it, it got to its worst and then it's now back to getting better and better yeah and, and importantly um it's doing that without a huge amount of effort. We, we, I mean, one, one thing that I don't talk, I've talked about on my YouTube channel that, that I'm on uh, TRT, hormone replacement therapy. And I mentioned it on YouTube uh, a while ago when I had about 5,000 subscribers because I never wanted to get into a situation where I was like every other fitness YouTube where people were saying, oh, you know, you know, are you natural? Are you not natural? And how to deal with it and sort of come out. I didn't, I didn't, I had nothing to, hide so i thought if i don't, I don't want to come out with this information i'm just going to say from the outset 
you know, <laughs> while nobody's watching me, oh, this is big news. And then you know, my five subscribers said, yeah, we don't care. Um, so it, it's all very open, but I don't discuss it very much because it's quite polarizing. The same as I don't, I don't discuss being vegan very much because it just, it just sends people from both sides loopy. Um, I have meat eaters tell me, no, you must eat your dog immediately. And I have actual uh, vegans telling me you're not, you're not vegan enough because you're not, you're not, you know, standing in McDonald's punching people eating Big Macs. So no, no one's happy, um, apart from me. Um, Moderates aren't allowed nowadays, Mark. Are we? We're no, not, we're indeed. No, I, I, it is funny. I do, I do vegan. vegan. My, my vegan stance is very simple. I'm a vegan, and I go to bed happy because I haven't eaten an animal that day. That's it. End of story. I don't, I don't, I literally don't care if someone eats their cat. If I hate cats, eat, eat as many cats as you like. Um, but um, <laughs> that, that, that's <laughs> cancel culture. I'm in trouble now, aren't I, with the cat owners? Um, but, but yeah, people will, the meat eaters will say, oh, no, no, you, you're going to, the amount of people have told me, you know, oh, I'll give it another six months and you're going to fall apart. I, well, I keep getting faster and fitter. And they go, well, another six months. And I kind of figure that I'm going to be 100 one day. And they'll be going, yeah, but when you're 110, that lack of meat's going to get you. And then, yeah, and then the vegans say, well, hang on a minute. If you're not, if you're not telling everyone to be vegan, then you aren't really vegan. So, so, um, so, the re so lunatics everywhere. So I don't mention TRT much. The reason I mention it occasionally is that sometimes people will say, well, of course you're getting better and better and faster and blah, 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 because you're on, you're on uh, TRT. And I, I, so I do try to emphasize every now and again that um, if people look at my, and I did a video on this recently, if people look at my daily training re regime and they think that I'm in any way maximizing my anything, they are bonkers. Uh, I train half hour sometimes a day 45 minutes a day I mean, it's not it's consistent but it's not i'm not training at any massive intensity um i get out of the weekend and i go into a park run um my my trt use which i have for, for mental health reasons it, it helps me feel great um is like a uh, it's like a, a a computer cheat boost that my character has kind of accrued but i've yet to hit the use the cheat boost if i wanted to train like a lunatic and, and massively up up increase my, my protein intake and calories and so on yeah maybe maybe i could be big and jacked who, who knows but also who cares I, I simply don't want to so yes i have this ability to do that but but i simply don't use it for that reason and people go ah oh, but you get great recovery i think great recovery from what you know i worked out for half an hour yesterday what, what sort of recovery needs do you think i have so um there are absolutely benefits to TRT, otherwise I wouldn't take it, but I am not in a million years maximizing its, its fitness potential. Uh, everything I have is achieved um, or could be achieved naturally. And in fact, was because my fastest ever park run was done before I, about a month before I started TRT. My fastest ever ultramarathon was done back then. In fact, there's actually very few things I have that I can do today that I couldn't do before then i just do them now feeling good that that's there's a lot of misconceptions about trt mark and i've hosted um tm cycles on the podcast thomas moore and right. he's yeah. he's very very good on on this topic because trt is not necessarily taking you outside of your super physiological range so it's not no. what, it's not you mentioned bumstead we mentioned um uh, mike thurston didn't we so like people who potentially are using a lot of uh, enhancements to, to reach the, the high level that they operate at in terms of the physique trt is not that like they're probably having double triple as well as lots of other compounds as well to oh, reach indeed. what they're what they're having so yeah. injecting testosterone which probably puts you at the higher end of natural levels and hovers you in that zone because otherwise yeah. you would start to potentially see some side effects if you went if you if you went beyond that and i think in the future we will actually see a lot of wellness clinics in the uk as we do in the us where people are prescribed trt more freely because to get prescribed trt in the nhs you basically have to be on a a, a very very uh, to, be the, to get it on the nhs they need to dig you up um and, and think oh yeah we should have prescribed it before he died um it's pointless exercise well i've never spoken to the nhs about it whatsoever and the people i've spoken to that have might as well have uh, punched themselves in the face. So you're right, we will see more private clinics. The only downside to more private clinics is that we might end up, well, we will, we'll end up where America is at the moment. And the slight problem, it, I mean, is it a problem, is it not? It, it's tricky. I mean, the bottom line, if every 50-year-old guy was on TRT, in fact, 
if every 50 year old guy was on Chris Bumstead levels of TRT, to a certain extent, who cares? If they're not flogging protein powder, if they're not um, trying to convince you that they're, if they're, not, if they're not lying, if they're not entering competitive sport that's tested, um, who cares? If you're 65 and you want to walk around jacked, whatever, I, I, I really don't care. That's fine. The trouble is, um, the trouble is, it, it just surrounds um, 19 year old or, or even worse, 16 year old boys with people taking steroids. They're, they're seeing it in the movies, they're, they're, they're seeing it in the gym, and now they're seeing their dad doing it. Um, and, and it just makes it incredibly, um, well, I said earlier, I said that it never even occurred to us to do steroids back in the 80s, we, and they were clearly around, um, never occurred to us. It would occur to my teenage boys, because I do. That, that's Now, because I do, and I'm hopefully intelligent enough to have a conversation with them and explain why and, and, and so on, they, they actually go the other way and they think, okay, we understand it completely. It's not for us. Um, and if it ever was, we know what we're doing. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit like um, whatever, sex, drugs, whatever you do with children. You, you can't stop your children. You can only educate them. Um, but there are clearly many, many kids whose dads are, are doing stuff or their, their uncle's doing stuff. And they think, wow, look, at, yeah, he's, he's, he's doing great. He's feeling great. What, why not me? And, and well, because your uncle doesn't need to be fertile. And you know, there's all sorts of reasons why not. Um, so the, the, my, my worry is that. My worry is not that, that, that there'll be lots of 50-year-old guys doing, doing TRT. My worry is that their kids will be, will be just thinking, it's no big deal. And... Um, and it is obviously for, for kids. Of course, I think um, I think the more um, the more information, the more clarity we have on these things, the better. Whereas when you do have influencers who aren't open about the endogenous hormones that they're injecting, or they're very ambiguous about the dosages, I think that's when people get into trouble. And I know a lot of young guys at gyms that I've trained at around the UK when I've been traveling with work or when I've been doing kind of promotional stuff through Instagram. There's guys that are doing like oral only cycles. There's guys yeah. that are injecting the guys that are injecting dosages, which would 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 be frightening for an Olympian. And you're yeah. thinking, how did you get to this stage? And again, another gentleman I host in the podcast, Doctor Dean St. Mar, is very very good in, in on on this topic, and he laughs at the amount of drugs that some people are taking. Laughs in terms of like it, it's yeah. bizarre, yeah. not the fact, not the not the actual effects of it, <laughs> yeah. but for the return that they're getting, because you're you're aim for anything as you said with your entry to exercise should be the minimum effective dose to get the maximum possible returns and you yeah. come from a, a financial services background it's the same for the amount of time that you may be tinkering with the different um, yeah. funds or stocks that somebody's um, in, investing in as well but um, one of the one of the questions that i was really keen to ask you about mark was with regards to your diet as well because you've, you've mentioned throughout this that your relationship with food was such that you're maybe eating numerous big macs for breakfast or you're eating them at, at three four in the morning how did you start to address that to both lose the weight but also to maintain it because i think you can sometimes see people when they're getting the positive feedback of the weight drop the relationship with food improves but when the weight may, maybe that journey doesn't continue and um, they go yeah. back the way um uh, yeah i mean th there's no question i i, I suffer from um I, I, the, the best way to this well, there's i suffer from an eating eating disorder that's the only way to describe it and i'm always slightly hesitant to say eating disorder the same as i'm hesitant to say that my eating disorder is comparable to something like alcoholism or something. Um, but, but that is the reality. And it's not, it's not to say it's, it's as bad as the worst examples of those things. Um, I'm clearly, if I was somebody that was suffering from uh, anorexia and, and was you know, in hospital weighing, weighing six stone, clearly that's a more severe, clearly a more severe eating disorder. Um, the same as if I was lying in the, in the gutter every morning from, from drinking alcohol, that'd be a worse addiction than, than having too many Big Macs. But it's a, it's a, um, it's a spectrum, and I'm, I'm, I'm on it. So that was the first acknowledgement that, that what I was doing wasn't normal, and that's actually quite helpful because sometimes I talk to people and I say, oh, you know, eat too much, and they go, yeah, yeah, I know, I'll, I'll, I'm the same. I'll, I'll pop open a pack of Pringles, and before I know it, half might be gone, and I'm like, half, you know, what, what the hell? I'm, I'm, I'm doing four tubes, um, and then going back to the kitchen to look for more. Uh, I, I always remember, um, you might be a bit young. Do you remember Bill Hicks, the comedian, Bill Hicks? Yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've heard of him, okay. but tell me again. Okay, um, so Bill, Bill Hicks, he just had a, he had a, he had a joke, he was a smoker, he had a joke about smoking. 
And um, one of his, his joke with the guy, the guy in the audience was, um, was uh, I'm going to butcher a Bill Hicks joke now, which is for anybody over 40, so it can be offensive. Um, he's like, oh, you're a smoker. He's like, yeah, how many, how many, how many do you smoke? He's like, um, oh, I'm doing two packs a day. And he's like, two packs a day? He's like, you pussy, I'm doing two light as a day. <laughs> and that's, that's what my disordered eating is like. So when I say to people, oh, yeah, I eat a bit too much, they go, yeah, yeah, I've had, I, I once had two, two burgers. I'm like, I'll buy two burgers to eat on the way home from McDonald's to keep me filled up before I get home and eat the meal I bought. So it was disordered eating. Uh, I acknowledged it at that. And I was just incredibly strict with myself. I mean, I would wake up every morning and it would just be my only focus that day. And I also embraced fads, uh, but acknowledged them as fads. So one thing I hear a lot at the moment is people going, oh, it's calories in, it's calories out. It's, it, that's just what it is. It's science. And to me, if that works for you, that's great, obviously. If anything works for you, it's great. But I, I'm, I don't like it as a blanket solution because to me, it's like, it's like walking into an AA meeting and saying, what's wrong with you all? It, it's alcohol in, alcohol out. Uh, solved. You know, I've, I've solved the alcoholism problem. Off I go. No, you haven't. Um, it, 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 that, that, that science doesn't, doesn't help. Um, I mean, science is science. But yeah, if, if your plane is crashing, saying to the pilot, dude, it's gravity. It's gravity, isn't it? Oh, well, thanks very much. We're still heading towards the Earth at, at yeah, 500 miles an hour. Um, so knowing the science, is, it doesn't help. Yeah, I, 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 so you need to hang your hat on something. And so for me, I've done intermittent fasting. I've done uh, keto. Back when I wasn't vegan, it's quite hard to be a keto vegan. I've done ke uh, keto. I've done, I mean, I've, I've kind of done... Apart from that, I haven't done daft things, but I've done all the kind of standard diets, not because I think that keto is the only way to lose weight or intermittent fasting is the be all and the end all, but because when I wake up in the morning, I think, oh, I'm intermittent fasting today. Um, and, and I know why it works. It's because I'm not eating any calories before two o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, there's no, I don't need to know any more science beyond that. Um, I'm not eating much. Uh, I know why keto works. I'm not having a gigantic bowl of fries on my plate. I mean, it, it, again, I don't need to know the science to know that it's going to work. Um, and so I would do those things. I would hang my hat on, I'm going to spend three or four weeks being keto. And when I fall off the keto wagon, that's okay. It didn't need to, it wasn't keto forever. And people would say, oh, that's evidence keto doesn't work. You, you only lasted a month. Well, yeah, I did, but I lost, I lost six pounds. I know why. I don't. And now I'm done with keto. I'm now going to do something else. And people go, oh, you're yo-yoing all over the place. No, I'm not. I'm consistently losing weight. So I'd, I'd do that. I would, I, would, um, I would jump between diets. I would jump between sports. I did, oh, I'm going to be kayaking. I'm getting into kayaking. And after six months, I'm bored with kayaking. Kayaking didn't fail. I lost a ton of weight kayaking. Um, so I, I really embraced that notion of if it works for me today, it worked for me today. If I go to bed at night and I didn't eat 5,000 calories because I was keto, um, good. I don't, yeah, will keto work tomorrow? Don't know. I'll worry about that tomorrow. So um, I don't like people being told it's calories in, it's calories out. Uh, uh, or even worse, when people say keto, that's just calories in, calories out. Uh, what are you talking about? That, that's like saying airplanes, that's just, that's just uh, you know, lift over gravity. Yeah, that, that's lovely. I still want... I still need an airplane. I still need, you know, I can't fly to America on science. I still need to get on a BA flight. So for me, keto, uh, whatever the diet is, um, that, that is the, the airplane. I don't, and I need to get in the airplane. I don't need to know the science. There's so much in what you've said there, Mark, about um, science being obviously calories in, calories out, energy expenditure. However, what you're talking about is behavioral science because you yeah. need some sort of methodology to be the vehicle as you would describe in the airplane there to fly yeah. across the atlantic yeah. whatever what, yeah. whatever analogy we want to use we can whenever we can, someone can... says thermodynamics whenever someone says to me <laughs> it's just the laws of thermodynamics i feel like punching them because uh, i mean what 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 am i supposed to yeah when i'm eating a big mac at, at, at three in the morning the law of thermodynamics does not stop me eating that big mac uh it's but thinking i can't eat this because it's bread and i'm keto that might stop me eating that Big Mac. Um, reading a physics book won't. So, 
yeah, people that, and, and typically people that say carries in, carries out, thermodynamics, uh, eat less, move more, typically don't have a history of, um, of, of disordered eating or, or weight problems, typically. There's a lack of understanding there. And, and I can completely agree there because while it's important that you understand that, of course, I need to be in an energy deficit, that's yep. great. I need a vehicle and a set of rules and practices that I can adhere to, like you said, the challenge in your head is not that this is going to take me out of my calorie deficit. The challenge in your head is that, oh, well, actually, if I eat this, it's actually an excluded food for me just now. And while yeah. some people would say that's terrible for a relationship with food, from somebody that is telling us that I had a, a history of disordered eating, this exclusionary rule actually enables me to adhere to what I actually have committed to, which is weight loss through a particular protocol. So yeah. I can completely see the value in it while acknowledging that, of course, it's underpinned by thermodynamics or whatever sign that to want to hang around. Exactly that. I mean, the 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 the, the vehicle is the best one. You know, I, I if I want to fly away on holiday and someone says to me, you know, how are you going to fly? And I go, well, I can go first class with BA or Virgin or whatever. Well, why don't you just go easy jet? They're all the same. They're all using, you know, lift over gravity. They're all using, uh, shut up. That one's going to, you know, serve me nuts and champagne. So that's, that's my preferred vehicle. And so if your preferred vehicle is keto because you like meat or your preferred vehicle is intermittent fasting because it just clicks for you, um, that's, you've picked your plane. All the planes are pretty much going in the same place. I mean, you, it's very hard to do keto properly and not have some degree of weight loss if you've got half a brain cell. Intermittent fasting even more so. I mean, the amount of people that say to me, intermittent fasting, it's rubbish. That's just having less calories. So yeah, I, I know. I don't need to tell me I'm not eating till two in the afternoon. I understand, you know, but, but I don't know why people need to kind of Put those things down i mean if someone says oh my diet is a tin of tuna every every friday and that's it okay, okay clearly you're hanging your hat on something insane that's um that that's the equivalent of someone saying oh i'm going i'm going on holiday by tying myself to 15 helium balloons and just hoping the wind goes the right way okay that's a vehicle but you know uh, you, you really want to check out what virgin have on offer instead so there is a wrong way to do it but yeah for me if someone says oh i want to use this approach um yeah cool if it works for you it works for you so that's all that's all i did i just bounced between different approaches um and more and more the weight came off i was keeping my little graph that showed me i that showed i was progressing um i was doing park run uh i mean i, I life-saving genuinely life-saving for me doing park run knowing that every saturday morning i was gonna turn up and run uh was um, yeah, I mean, it, that, 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 that life saving. I can't, there's no other word for it. I'm not entirely sure I'd be here today. I certainly wouldn't be here doing this today if it wasn't for Park Run. Um, and if I have a video the, 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 tomorrow, where are we now? No, Saturday. This Saturday, I'm doing my local park run with my grandchild in a backpack and a weighted vest on so that I weigh 300 pounds just to go and do Park Run like I used to do Park Run and see if that's even possible. Um, because that's what I was doing out. I was doing it way over 300 pounds. Shows how far you've up. come. Yeah. And uh, yeah, someone said to me, oh, are you, are you fast now because you're fit or because you're light? I thought, well, let's find out. Let's, let's be fit and heavy. Um, so we'll see on Saturday. But yeah, park run was a big run. Um, and, and seeing in the mirror, you know, when, when you look in the mirror and you, 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 you don't look um, as bad. And I, whenever I say I looked bad or I, you know, I, I was disgusted with how I look, people were, kind of get very triggered about it. Uh, bottom line, I, I'm allowed to feel within reason about how I look, how I want. Um, and looking in the mirror and seeing 350 pounds bouncing up and down uh, and saying, that's grim. I don't, I think if anyone says, no, you, you're being too hard on yourself, I, I think they are wrong. Um, that That is not a good look. It is not, and, and not just that. I say I got married young. I I, you know, I met my ex-wife now my wife then when I was 19 20 and I wasn't 350 pounds and I, I'm uh, you know they're, they're, people say oh you know, you're okay to change yeah what if you had a you know yachting accident and you lost a leg would, would you expect you know someone to leave you because you lost a leg no well, I didn't have a yachting accident I ate 4,000 burgers um I, I I felt 
I felt that I was, I didn't feel it was very fair. I didn't feel it was very fair to have changed the way I did. Um, so there was that as well. I was motivated to, um, yeah, to, to sort of rectify Become that. a better version of yourself again, which... Well, just become be... the version I was. You know, and, you know if I, <laughs> it sounds dark, but if I went and bought a car and after a couple of years, it, it turned from being a, whatever, a 911 into being a uh, bag of old crap, probably wandering the Porsche and say, you guys never told me this car was going to just become this piece of junk. And if they went, oh, well, you know, that happens sometimes. That, that's what I felt like. I felt like, not that I was a 911 when she met me, but I was, um, I felt like I, I, yeah, she wasn't getting a very fair deal. It's very fair to say. And that works now. You know, I've been with Jenna for 10 years. Um, uh, it crosses my mind and probably crosses her mind as well that, that you know, we have an expectation of each other based on the person we met and everyone grows and changes and that's all fine. But, um, there are still, uh, limits. If I, if I, if I became somebody very, very different and, and it, it would be right for her to say, she might say, I love that. I love that new look. Um, but it would also be fair, fair to say, well, I'm not, that's not what I married and we should have a discussion about that. You know, you, I, you I, can, I completely agree, but I, I, I wonder in today's society whether people are even willing to, to hear that. But I think that's one of the reasons, you, I mean, you got accused of fat shaming on your own channel, which I thought was fat shaming myself. remarkable. Yeah, yeah I was fat shaming. Yeah, I, I made the joke that uh, I, I was uh, I, I fat shamed. I was fat shamed because I look at photographs that I take them myself and think that's a shame and throw it in the bin. Um, and someone said to me, oh, you're, you're fat shaming. I was like, fat, I, I, that's literally how I felt. I'd look at a photograph of me, obese, and think that's horrible. And I have, I have annoyingly now, because I'd love to use them on YouTube, I don't have very many photographs of me being stupidly overweight. Um, although I found one the other day. I, I was doing a Christmas video, and I found a photograph of me with my little kid who's now 18 when he was about 10. Uh, and there's him and this giant snowman and me, and I am the size of the giant snowman. I, mean, I literally look like a snowman back then. Um, yeah, I was fat showing myself. I think with 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 uh, with relationships, you have to be, and again, this this is from a financial services background. I am very comfortable sitting with my whoever, anybody. I mean, clients back then, but now partner, children, parents, whatever, and saying there are things that we need to discuss. Uh, whether it is looking at your will or the fact that you're three stone heavier than you were two years ago, or, or whatever it might be, and we need to discuss them because the implications of not doing so are severe. And as a financial advisor, I would have conversations with clients about, well, what if you're dead? And I got very used over the years to people sitting there in tears because they were contemplating death, but then snapping out of it and thinking, no, we probably should have a plan in place. So I'm just very comfortable uh, sitting with Jen, my wife, and saying, um, you know, I, 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 want to, I want to be doing, as I did with her months ago, I said, look, I want to exercise and doing these high rocks competitions and stuff to be a real part of my life. Be great if you're involved. If you try it and think that sucks, I don't care. That's cool because I'll think, well, she tried it and didn't like it. And and I I try plenty of things that she suggests that that, that I don't like. But it would be it would be weird if I said to you, this is really important to me, and you said, well, I won't even try it. That would just be odd as a couple. And so she said, that's fair enough. Yeah, we, th th I'll try it. So um, she did and loved it. And but but had she not loved it. I, I would be sat here today quite content that it was something she didn't like. You'd be pleased because she she would open a mind enough to consider yeah. it. And I, I love why, that you... why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you try anything? I mean, if she said to me, hey, I want to go to, I don't know, Budapest, which is something she said to me. I was like, Budapest? Really? I want to go. Well, cool. If you want to go, let's go to Budapest. Well, who am I to say no? I, you know, I've got I, I've got many years to go before I'm dead. Let's, let's use a week going to Budapest. It's not going to kill me. Um, the same with exercise for her. I said, let's let's try a high rocks event. She she, she fell in love with it. And uh, but if she hadn't, that wouldn't that wouldn't matter either. I don't I don't like people that just say no. Uh, I think life is too short to to say no to to, to much. Really, I mean, who you know? You, I don't regret anything I've ever done, but there are plenty of things I wish I had done and will get around to doing one day. Um, yeah. Of course, and one of those things is uh, is is one of the reasons that we're speaking today is, is is your YouTube channel. But I wanted to ask, what role did your son making a Minecraft video play in in Mark Lewis becoming the YouTuber that we uh, that we all watch now? Yeah, he he had, so he had a, he had a he had a YouTube channel. Um, this he would have been about eleven at the time, and he said, "Oh, a thousand people have watched my YouTube video." 
And I said, well, you, I've seen you play Minecraft. I, I've seen Minecraft. It, it's all stupid. So that's a thousand morons. Don't be proud of that. Anybody could clearly do that if you can do it. And he said, no, you can't. I said, well, I'll set up a YouTube channel and I'll beat you and show you how useless you are. Um, parenting book in the shops anytime now. Uh, and, and yeah, that's it. So I set up a YouTube channel. Just And I, I crushed him because I went out and I, I knew nothing about anything. I knew nothing. I mean, when I say to people, I didn't know. People go, oh, you probably knew a bit. I knew nothing. Um, I didn't know what editing meant. I didn't know what, I didn't know anything. I, mean, I, can't, I can't put it any more clear than that. So I went out. And I bought an iMac. I literally walked into Apple and said, I want to be a, a YouTuber. What do I need? So I bought an iMac. I bought an expensive camera and spent thousands on it and cobbled together a video. I also went to, uh, to Africa with Jenna and we drove motorcycles across the desert because I thought that's more exciting than some Minecraft rubbish. And I made a video about that. So I kind of cheated my way into getting uh, uh, probably only about 1,100 views. I only, beat, I only just beat him. Uh, it would be embarrassing. You know, the, 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 the cost to reward ratio was pretty poor. And then was left with a YouTube channel that had one motorcycling video on it and nothing else and just thought that's a bit pointless. So a year later, started uh, strapping a GoPro to me when I was doing Spartan races, obstacle course races, and was amazed because I had like, you know, whatever, 12 people watching me. And I thought that is not, that can't be just my mum watching it 12 times. What's going on? And just became into, uh, into that. And then one day I... I, the, the growth of the YouTube channel was very simply that I did these Spartan races and, and had people watching it and found that quite, uh, that's quite an ego boost actually. When, when, when strangers watch what you're doing, that's a, that no one can really be failed to be a little bit excited about that. And then one day I started putting some jokes in because I'd always, I, I did stand-up comedy for a while years ago and I'd always been a bit disappointed that I couldn't do more of it, but it just wasn't practical to do stand-up comedy as a grown-up adult with family and stuff. And I found that through YouTube I could, I could do some funny jokes and, and so on. And people seemed to like that. I thought, oh, hang on a minute. I'm doing fitness content. I'm feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome because I'm not a fitness anything. But suddenly, if I do jokes, um, I'm, I, I, feel very, I feel very at home doing this. And, uh, and suddenly, I, don't, I, feel like, I feel like I am actually the funniest fitness YouTuber uh, called Mark in the UK. So I kind of found this little niche that I could say, no, within that world, I'm, I'm all right. And, and from there, I then just, well, first of all, I just enjoyed it. I just found a creative, a creative outlet. I love writing. I love language and, and structure of, of language and, and, and what makes something funny and, and what doesn't. So that was the creative outlet. And, and then, yeah, just kind of grew and grew and grew and got to the point where I thought, oh, it's now making enough money that I can just do this on, it, on its own. I think the style of video is something like you say is it you found your own niche because we were talking before we hit record about you're you're, you're never going to be one of these vloggers that jumps up and says here's my morning coffee here's my pre-workout meal and I'm off to the gym to do this session no because it's not me. funny it's not funny and, and not that it has to be funny but for me for me it has to be funny um and so I I I tried I have tried doing that um well here's a good example I said I'm doing this 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 run on Saturday with my kid in the backpack uh, that will be filmed predominantly on location, as it were. It won't just be me sat at my desk, which is what most of my videos are. But 95% of the jokes will be written tomorrow um, in preparation for that. So, so that's how I do outside work. I prepare it meticulously. Um, and, and inside work is even more so. I mean, it's a tape prompter. It's, it's literally it's scripted. The way any good TV show or stand-up comedy or anything, you know, music, whatever, is scripted. Um, I can't do the, yeah, roll out of bed, uh, alarm clock goes off, you make your coffee in slow motion, and then you say, today I'm going to eat like the rock, and here's what happened. I, I, that type of YouTube video, if it works, great, and if you love it, great. It's just not for me. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't take my creative. You wouldn't have the longevity box. doing that. Like uh, 160,000 odd subscribers would not have occurred if you tried to mimic that style that didn't feel suitable to you in the same way we're talking at the start in terms of people nowadays are going to be like oh I'm, I'm a young guy i'm going to go and train like chris bumstead or whoever yeah. bodybuilder i see rather than your own version of fitness you've got your own version of youtube and you're the best version of mark lewis versus not some sort of aldi version of um, rob lips or joe delaney or, or mike thurston yes yes yeah. so, and, and, and i i um i it took me a while to, to realize that i mean i started off watching 
what I started off doing was I'd watch people like Casey Neistat on YouTube and thought, I love that style of YouTube. I'll, I'll try and make that. But then realized that I, I, I can't. I can't make that. Um, so I had to really kind of go back to square one and think, what can I do? Okay, I can write a script that's tight and, and funny and I can do that. So let's do that and let's worry about nothing else beyond that. Once I had that sorted, I then thought, what I'll now do is I'll now go to people like Mr. Beast, for example, um, because clearly he's doing something right. But I'll go to him, not like I went to Casey Neistat in the beginning, but I'll go to him and I'll just really meticulously pick the bits that I think I can take, but not alter my style. So, for example, my, my videos lately have got the first 30 seconds have got much more uh, punchy with, with um, visuals and, 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 and also preempting what's going to be happening in the video, a very Mr. Beast style of thing to do, but it doesn't detract from my videos being me. So it took me a while to do that, to learn, no, be me first and, and be happy with creating content that is, that, that is mine and then you can go out and pick the bits you want to sort of sprinkle over that. What too many YouTubers do, I find, is they simply go, "No, I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm gonna, uh, that. That's what I'm going to copy him, and then I'll make that my own." That's a really, really hard way of doing something, um, and, and it just, it just doesn't work. So I, I, I thought I won't be afraid of. Um, and again, this is <laughs> my ego knows no bounds. I can remember watching Reservoir Dogs at the cinema whenever that was, 91, 92, and just thinking, oh, my God, this is awesome. Like, this is just, it's, it's dialogue. It's, there's not much action in the traditional sense. No one's doing this. This is, and so when I think, oh, my videos, it's just me talking at my desk. Is that, you know, who's going to, I think, no, you know, Tarantino didn't think, oh, I need to make this a bit more Spielberg-like. He just thought, no, I like dialogue. I like, I like funny one-liners. I'm going to make it like this. So, that's I, I I yeah that's what I've tried to do with YouTube. I thought no, all I can you know someone said to me the other day, or oh, you're you're fit. You're, why aren't you going to coaching? Why aren't you is the next step to coach? Uh, no, no. I'm if the next step was anything, it'd be to go and do stand up comedy. You know, I'm I'm making funny YouTube videos. It just happens to be based around fitness because that's what I do as a hobby. If I was thirty years older and had given up a lot of my fitness, but was now traveling around in a camper van, I'd be making funny videos about that. Um, it's, it's funny videos first, what I happen to be doing second. That's a very good level of self-awareness because I think a lot of people would pigeonhole themselves into a particular type of content, but you're just saying it's whatever my area of interest and hobbies are that I spend my time doing. And the template and the niche is comedic, but motivational, inspiring yeah. to the demographic you're speaking to. Well, the best example of it is Top, is top Gear. Someone said to me uh, about a year ago, they said, oh, your channel's like Top Gear, but, but to do a fitness. And my, my gut reaction was, that that was uh, disparaging in some way. But actually, I've, I've grown to love that comment because if you look at Top Gear, uh, the, the guys, are, the old Top Gear, obviously, Clarkson and, and, and his two uh, idiot buddies, those, those guys weren't great drivers. No one's watching Top Gear. No one's watching Jeremy Clarkson to learn how to be a great driver. And nobody's watching my channel to learn how to be a great anything sporting. Um, but equally, Clarkson could probably drive around a track quicker than Joe Bloggs simply through the fact that he does it a lot. That's me. I'm Jeremy Clarkson of fitness. I'm better at fitness than most people, but I'm no athlete. Um, but equally, Clarkson could make it as he has done. He could he could go off from cars and make content about farming or whatever he's doing now. And people will go, oh, I get it. I, it's Clarkson, but he's now talking about tractors, not not Porsches. So that's what I try to do. I, 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 the, 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 I try to be me, um, funny, witty, hopefully, um, snappy fast paced and and then yeah it, it happens to be fitness what would be amazing would be to big enough be big enough one day that i could expand it really quite wide and still get people at the moment that's slightly dangerous territory because whenever i expand into something else uh, I'm, I, I lose my existing subscriber base because they're there for the fitness and it, it, it's, it's tricky territory to do that it's slightly self-indulgent actually to do that because i think um, I can make a video about anything and people will still find it funny. And the reality is that I'm not quite big enough to, to get away with doing that. Um, so I do it sparingly. But uh, but that's the goal. The goal is one day people will just watch because they think, I, I like what that guy's doing. Um, I don't care Absolutely. if he's talking about rowing or whatever, camper I, th I, th I think I think you are building 
towards that though and we, we we were talking again before we hit record the what magic sometimes happens when we when we first jump on the call doesn't it and <laughs> i uh, i i was interested when you were saying that some of the videos that maybe don't perform as well you look at the comment section and the feedback's really positive those are like your really loyal fans true fans like we, one of the one of the influences for me is like a thousand true fans is like a a, a a really important thing to build and then from there you can kind of not do what you want, but you can do things that you know that those people will show up and be like, okay, I like that because of Colin. I like yes. that because of Mark. Yes. And that's yeah. really valuable. But of course, scaling that to a level where you can still run a full-time YouTube channel and explore the different levels of interest that you want. And I guess those people that have been with you along the way, they will come with you if if, if, if they really are there for Mark and your humor and what you're delivering. Yeah, and, and also you're slightly reliant upon the YouTube algorithm, which doesn't know any of that. It just knows what's what's. It just knows what's being watched. So um, you have to. I mean, you you. I'm quite. So for example, here's a good example. Actually, I, I made a video a little while ago that was a parody of those daft um, uh, bringing an expert to review movies. So they'll bring in like a whatever a submarine commander, and he'll review Crimson Tide and Hunt for Red October and stuff and all that nonsense. I thought I'd, I'll do one where I review training montages in movies. Uh, and I, I made that video. And that video, by my standards, was uh, comedy genius. It was, uh, <laughs> I, when I finished that video, I thought, man, that's exactly what I had in my head. I've nailed that. That, that could be, uh, that's just perfect. Anybody that gets that is going to just be rolling around the floor laughing. And so I upload it. And it gets watched by my, as you say, my loyal subscribers, and and they go, yeah, that's that that funny. I like that, and uh, and then it stops because because then it stops because no one else gets it. Uh, they don't people don't know me. I you know it's it, it's 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 like when Ricky Gervais first put The Office on TV, um, people are tuning in thinking, what what is this real? Is this a documentary? What well, I don't get it, and it, and it and it tanks. Now Ricky Gervais could put any old nonsense on TV, and occasionally does, and enough people will watch it so yeah that that's where i'm at i have people that will just watch my stuff um and that's great but i have to also appreciate that that isn't quite enough and very importantly their feedback those loyal subscribers feedback isn't necessarily all that useful i know we touched on this before we started having someone that loves my stuff say mark this is the funniest thing i've ever seen is delightful it's a it's a lovely ego boost but it's not real it's no more real than the lunatic that says, I hate you and I, you know, I, I, I hope you get by car. That, that it, it's just, it, 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 throw away. It, it doesn't, I can't do anything with it. It's, um, I, need, I need hundreds of thousands of people to watch my videos. So what one, two, three, four, five, even a hundred people say isn't necessarily too important. Um, it, it's, it, it's not the it's critical not, mass required to vote. No. It just for isn't. it to reach no. people on YouTube and to grow to the scale that you're aiming to go towards. So Absolutely. if that movie review video is one of your favorites that you've created, what's one of your favorite fitness challenges that you've done? Fitness challenges, probably the 100K. I've done a 100K ultramarathon twice. Um, and it's, it's my favorite in the sense that it genuinely is a challenge. Some of the challenges I do aren't that hard um, for, for me that in the sense that uh, for example, high rocks. I do high rocks events. They're tough, but it, you know, it's an hour, an hour of running around. It's not not that big a deal. But the hundred k ultras for me, at my weight and size, and and without a huge amount of running background, a distance running background, that's a real challenge. That that actually pushes me to the limit, and they're reasonably well received. So that that that's beautiful. Uh, I I find it tough, but people say people watch it and say, hey, that was that was entertaining. That and and that's entertaining that's the important bit i don't need someone to say that's great i've learned a lot about how to run an ultra marathon i really couldn't care less whether they learn how to run an ultra marathon in fact you want to learn how to run an ultra marathon don't watch me you'd be bonkers to do that uh just entertained so they're, they're, they're the best ones um i wish i which is why i'm doing the video on saturday i wish i'd been filming myself at 300 pounds running around park run because that would have been uh entertaining <laughs> of sorts and truly useful to people but I, I just didn't do it. I wasn't, um, well, actually, when I was doing it, I don't think YouTube really existed. Uh, so that I, that's, for me, my, my proudest moment was, was kind of running under half an hour at a park run and stuff. Uh, a bigger deal for me was getting under 30 minutes than it was when I got under 20 minutes. 
And yet most people would regard running under 20 minutes at 6'6 six, six and 220 pounds and nearly 50, uh, you know, quite an achievement. But, and it is physically, but, but for me, yeah, I would love to have had a camera back, back then in um, whenever it was when I was doing those 30 minute park runs. Um, well, we'll see on Saturday when I, when I stagger around with my kid on my back. <laughs> of course, of course. But equally, I can completely recognize why that particular moment is of greater significance than the under 20 minutes because the under 20 minutes, you would have worked towards that quite a lot already in a position of already being healthy. Whereas to get under 30 minutes was probably one of the first signs that actually I'm going very much in the right direction. And I'm starting to get to a level where I am the tagline that you have above yeah. average because yes, God, knows, God knows what the average park run time would be if everyone in the population was forced to do it every Saturday morning. It would be probably quite frightening. Oh, yeah. Well, well the, you'd be measuring an average park run death, I imagine, if you forced everyone to run 5K. I, and the, the other thing is that I... When I did that third, sub 30, I didn't know it was possible. I literally thought, I'll never do that. Whereas I knew the sub 20 was possible. I knew because I looked at the graph. The graph was just going that way. For example, on my, my PB park run at the moment, 5K is 19 minutes 11. My PB one mile is five minutes, five minutes 11. I know, just I know, that I will one day run under 19 minutes and I'll one day run under five minutes for a mile. I just know that. Um, it's uh it, it's the, the graph goes that way i just need to get down and train for it so when it happens it's inevitable it's it's nice but it's also inevitable it's like going on holiday to somewhere cool when you land this is amazing but no surprise you, have, you know that's what your plane was supposed to do so the big thing for me was when i achieved something that i didn't think i could do and that doesn't happen very often uh the, the 100k ultra was a good example of that when i i, I love that i love I love doing things that I'm not supposed to be able to do. Um, I'm doing speed climbing uh, with one of the top speed climbers in the country in the beginning of January, uh, which clearly is so I'm not supposed to do. I'm far At too six heavy. Foot six, and, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're going to go up those those two walls that go side by side, and uh, and and uh, if I can even get up it, if I get to the top of that, it might take me 20 minutes versus his 12 seconds. That would be an amazing achievement. Uh, far more so, for example, than jumping on the rowing machine and rowing faster than any other 49-year-old in the country, which I know I can just do. Um, people say to me, oh, I entered the rowing championships. Yeah, kind of why? Why? I mean, it just... I don't... It's interesting how your mind works from that perspective because there could be the opportunity to double down and be extremely good at something, but you would much rather be a generalist and a hybrid athlete across multiple different areas and explore all these different new exciting areas for you? Yeah, well, I, I, the best example, purely from a commercial point of view, if you discovered that Jeremy Clarkson had, was going to enter the Porsche Cup or something, who cares? Literally, who, who cares? Even the best Jeremy Clarkson fan just wouldn't care. Um, if you discovered that he was going to, um, well, as has happened, run a farm, people are genuinely interested. So there's that. I mean, nobody would care that I was an amazing, I'm already a good rower, just genetically. I mean, there's no, there's no skill to it whatsoever. I'm just huge, and that just helps from rowing. If I was, if I was even faster, it just, it's so pointless. Um, but, if, but, but, but if I could go and do something that I've never done before, that to me is just, it, it, again, life, it, it, yeah. I've been on holiday to, um, let's say, New York. I've been to New York a few times. And I've never been to, I can't think of somewhere, let's say LA. For me, the holiday, the next holiday will be go, go, go West Coast, go to LA, go do that. And so we could go, ah, oh, but if you go to New York, you could do New York even better. You could, this time you could, I've done, I've done New York, I've seen it. I'm going to go to LA. That for me is like rowing. Uh, I'm fast. You could be even faster. Cool. Or I could try and climb up a mountain thing indoors. That just sounds like a much more enjoyable thing to do I, I don't i don't need to go and people are always saying to me my rowing technique interestingly is appalling i i, I again I, I don't watch me for it it's, it's it's not a good way to row and people say but if you improve your technique this would happen that one. i simply don't care um i don't need to be any faster i'm more interested in learning how to kite surf novelty example. is a greater yeah. value of yours yeah just um again like holiday people say to me oh we're going on holiday to wherever Mallorca again we go every year and stay in the same flat and we you know we know that we know the neighbors and it, good grief really you know look at a globe there's so many things you could go and do and uh I, I, so for me fitness experience uh it's, it's about that it's about 
just grabbing little bits of everything. Uh, when I'm when I'm ninety, I, I won't remember my rowing time, but I'll remember that once I rowed and once I kite surfed and once I climbed up a mountain and you know, whatever. Um, that that experience to me, and I, that, that's something that as I got older, I've got more into. Um, when I was younger, I would get very fixated on one thing, whether it was whatever, earn lots of money or, or, or whatever the, the, the thing was, I, I, I'd get obsessed with it and want to do it. Now, I'd rather just do a little bit of everything, um, really, and just, yeah, experience. I'm glad you've, I'm glad you've shared that, Mark, because I'm definitely somebody that indexes on the things that he enjoys and doubles down on that. And the majority of the listeners are kind of between 25 to 35. So you sharing that wisdom in terms of, as I've aged, I've started to look at these different areas that maybe I would want to optimize more for experience. And I had a gentleman called Sahil Bloom on the podcast, and he said one of the good frameworks he has is do things that your 10 year old self and your 80 year old self would be happy with. 10 because you're extremely innocent you're not really corrupted you're not very cynical and 80 because you're going to look back and be like oh it was great that i did all these different things and do i really care that colin i got an extra inch on my on my bicep for for next year's photo shoot which is something i've really had to challenge myself with in in recent years because that's how i've been minded before so i find that a very helpful framework combined of course with your ability to share your experience there well, well 25 to 35 is when i i i did exactly that i mean as, as a very simple example uh a few years ago um poker online poker became a big thing and i started playing online poker um and my obsession with wanting to be great meant that i literally quit work for six months i, I literally said to my boss i'm taking six months off and i spent six months playing professional poker until at the end of six months, I thought I'm making the same as I'm making if I was in financial services, but it requires me to be up at four o'clock in the morning playing poker with Americans online, and it's now got boring. So I went back to, to work. And then I got into uh, kite buggying, where you have the kite and you sit in a little buggy. I don't even know why I bought one, but I decided I wanted to be the best kite buggier in the world. I mean, it was ridiculous. Uh, I just had these obsessions in fact this is a reference that you're far too young for but years ago on the, on the friends tv show monica had a boyfriend actually who turned out to be john favreau the famous director he wanted he was rich and had nothing else to do so he wanted to become the ultimate world fighting champion that was just his thing i was that i just had nothing in my life so when something popped up i thought i'll just do that i'll be the best poker player ever i'll be the best. i got into wakeboarding I want to be a wakeboarding world champion. And that's so career. different to what you do now because you do things on such a broad spectrum now, whereas yeah, in the past you was became nuts. obsessed by one thing. That's yeah. mad. And, I, I act, and what I do is I actively cap it now. So with something like High Rocks, which I've got, I've, I've got quite into, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not great at, but I'm okay, certainly had the potential to be better. When I feel that urge to really push it and see how well I could do, I cap it. So, for example, the next High Rocks event I'm running, I'm running with a £20 weighted vest, and I'm doing it for charity, which, which will mean that I simply can't do very well. I'm lugging £20 around. It's going gonna, it's gonna to crush my tire, probably come last. So it takes away any, uh, any impulse to, to see how good I could be. I'm literally just stomping on that. Uh, I'm going to crush that attempt by weighing myself down, and instead I'm going to get excited about going and climbing some speed walls. Um, but so I have to do that. I have to. I have to suppress that urge to be the best. I think anybody that's a little bit sort of um, alpha-y, uh, you know, the temptation to be the best is maybe it's just a male thing. It's there, uh, and I don't find it very helpful at all. Uh, it's good to be good, but there comes a point where, for most people, being even better. And again, this is another social media thing. If you look at the people on social media telling you, no, you do need to be the best. You need to be you know, first in the gym, last out of the gym, hardest worker in the room, go one more, all that type of thing. No, you don't. We need those people in the world because otherwise we don't have Elon Musk and we don't have you know Bill Gates. We don't have people that are that. But most people don't need to be that. You don't need, Why do I need to be first in the gym and last out of the gym when the alternative is leave the gym a bit early and go watch a great movie? You know, well, I don't, as long as I'm fit and I'm healthy, um, I'd rather be watching a great movie than in the gym at 10.30 at night on, on, a, on a weekday. So I'm, I've, I've really settled into being just quite good as opposed to illusions, or not even illusions, because they are illusions. I could be very good at some things, but 
but why they just they just leave me um like buying a brand new car you get a new car and you're excited and then two weeks later it's just your car you've and hedonically you, adapted of course yeah, you have. yeah and, and 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 at, and at what cost tens of thousands of pounds for a car or hundreds of hours of effort working out and you know and, and people go well it's good for you uh, is it you know once you get to a certain point 80 percent of your health improvements come from um you know the first chunk of work you do beyond that it's even questionable as to whether it is healthy i mean for example if, if you look like you know, let's use chris bumstead any sort of mr olympia that that isn't you know you could back off a little bit certainly put down the you know the the, the chemistry set and you would be healthier you know it isn't the case that all these people at the top of their game are the most healthy um even whatever kipchoge I'm sure if Kipchoge wound things down a bit, his joints would thank him when he turns 80. Uh, but but we hold those people up as being what we should aim for. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And it's funny. There's there's some there's somewhere in between these elite level people and the kind of general level of population that we we've spoken about during the podcast who have gotten so unhealthy and kind of moved away and are, are being told to to embrace it as well. But it certainly seems that you've done a lot of uh, of self work, Mark. And, and one of my last questions for you is: the last ten years have been by all accounts really successful you've started to change your mindset you've changed your health you've grown this youtube channel you're really pursuing things that you seem to care about and apply yourself what would happen to happen in the next 10 years for you to deem those a success too the next 10 years i don't know i don't know and and i slightly i slightly don't care um uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, and I, I don't, I, I, I'm very much relaxed, and I appreciate that um, that my my past career, because when I, when I left my old job, I, I sold that business, so I have um, I have the luxury that that many people don't have in their forties and fifties of being uh, financially free to do uh, kind of what I want. Um, and if YouTube failed, um, it would be, I'd be, I'd be primarily disappointed because it'd be a creative outlet that I love that I wouldn't be you know when I say failed YouTube can't fail because I could upload and nobody could watch it I could still keep uploading but it would then become questionable as whether it was worth my time my my my, my wife would very be very valid in saying why are you doing eight hours a day on something that that literally makes no money that would be stupid so that would be a failure um but financially I could afford for it to fail and, it, and I, I would just do nothing um or, or I'd, I'd I go and stack shelves in the supermarket. I, I, I don't. So, so it's tricky. Having taken away the need to earn any any degree of, of money because I've I've spent a long time doing that already. Um, it purely comes down to my contentment and happiness. And I put contentment first. Important, importantly, I think people are. I had a conversation with a neighbour about this the other day, but we were both drunk at about four in the morning. Um, we had a, a neighbor's party for Christmas. So I'm going to relay this conversation back now sober and it might not make much sense. We were talking about people pursuing happiness and, and, and like you say, you know, what would you say? What would make you happy? And what, you know, what would you regard as a success? And this, we have nowadays this constant desire to be better. You know, that what we, we've got the, the stock market has to be up next year. The economy has to grow. Uh, everything has to be better. My iPhone needs to be better next year than it was this year. And if it isn't, it's a failure. You know, things aren't developing. It's a failure. And that attitude has clearly got us from living in trees to, you know, where we are now. So it does have, it does have clearly merit. But when you look at animals, any animal, whether it's your dog or a chimp living in the jungle his objective at the end of the day is to think well you know, am i okay am I a content day yes well then tomorrow i'll have another content day i'll be perfectly happy doing what i did yesterday I, that that chimp isn't thinking um well i climbed up that tree in 15 seconds today so i'm gonna see if i can do it in 14 seconds tomorrow he's simply happy that he climbed a tree so i'm trying to take that uh into i i, I go to bed every night and think Happy today? Yes. Um, well, then I'll just repeat it tomorrow. And clearly, that that, that doesn't mean that if things like YouTube grow, I I, I want to suppress that growth. Like, clearly, growth is, is great. Um, but I'm allowing it to happen very organically rather than really chasing it. Um, yeah, but my, 
I, I look at my dogs. My, my dogs every day have the same life every single day. They run as fast as they run, and they'll run just as fast tomorrow. And they are very, very happy dogs. Um, they aren't trying to be better and faster. If they were fat, waddling along, out of shape, lumps, that'd be bad. So this isn't just give up. You, you've, got to, you've got to have a certain degree of, of, uh, of fitness and health and, and wealth. You've got to have all those things. Uh, but once you're there, I'm a big believer in just um, do all those things. I said this in the last video that I did. If you do all those things, you make sure that you're reasonably healthy, reasonably successful. Everything is just looking pretty good. What you've done is you've exposed yourself to then other good things happening. People say make your own luck. You don't. Luck is luck. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called luck. But like a surfer that, that, that catches an amazing wave, this was from my last video. A surfer that catches an amazing wave didn't make the wave, didn't create the wave. It's luck that wave comes along. But they aren't surfing it unless they are fit and healthy and able to surf and in the ocean. So what I've done here with YouTube, I have placed myself in, in, the, in the ocean. And, and I have all the attributes, I hope, that if an amazing wave comes along, I catch it. And I will catch it just the same as an Olympic level surfer, or I don't have it in the Olympics today, an, an elite surfer. We're both catching the same wave. He might ride it better than me, but so what? We are both catching it. I don't need to be the best YouTuber in the world. I need to just, I need to be pretty good plonk myself into that world um, and and then just and then just kind of you know paddle around and wait and see what happens and um and it's perfectly pleasant being out in the ocean um, or if an amazing wave comes along I catch it if I was 350 pounds uh, rolling around on the beach um, looking like I breached myself um, I, I'm not catching any wave um, you've not given even, yourself the opportunity. No, absolutely. I've denied myself the opportunity. So, uh, but equally, I'm not flapping about in the ocean having a hissy fit because there's no great waves. I, I'm just, I'm just here. I'm ready. If it happens, it happens. Um, so, to answer your question, I have no idea. I'm simply paddling around, waiting to see what happens. If it comes putting along, yourself in the best crazy. position possible, and whatever happens, happens, and you're going to enjoy whatever comes absolutely. up. Absolutely. And in the meantime. Am I happy right now? You know, and and and, and like a, a surfer just kind of treading water in whatever Malibu or something. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty happy. It doesn't mean that I've also you know, I've also exposed myself to getting bitten by a shark. Uh, yeah, that bad things happen. Yeah, you, you people often I hear that sometimes. People go, oh, well, th this could happen, that could happen. Yeah, absolutely. You go surfing, you might get eaten by a shark. Um, so I'm not saying bad things don't happen. Uh, I'm just saying that um, that I'm I, I'm in I'm in the best place to capitalise if they do. If they don't, this is perfectly pleasant anyway, and I probably won't get bitten by a shark. I love that perspective, Mark. Thank you very much for sharing it, and I'm sure people have enjoyed this conversation as much as I have. We've gone for almost uh, just over 90 minutes, and I, I think we could go for another 90 quite easily. But where should people head towards to continue the conversation with you? Uh, well, well, YouTube's the easiest place, and I try and keep it simple. I, I have. Yeah, you go to YouTube, uh, you'll find everything there. So to just Mark Lewis on YouTube, I'm now big enough that when you type in Mark Lewis, you'll find me. Uh, it used to be that you'd find a, a celloist from Ohio or something that was a bigger Mark Lewis than I am. But uh, not anymore. I've kicked that celloist butt and I'm now... Uh, <laughs> You've overtaken I'm, him. I'm dominating the world of Mark Lewis's on YouTube. So yeah, easy as Brilliant. That. That'll be linked in the show notes, guys. Thank you very much for joining me and I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.